thank you very much for joining us um, at this no, event pinta, this is um, on um, Ukraine and the EU and how the war in Ukraine is uh, affecting and changing uh, our perspectives and relations and how the sanctions work, etc. The war in Ukraine, I think, leaves no one untouched. First of all, of course, and importantly, on a personal level, but we're also rapidly discovering that this will probably be none of us untouched also on a professional level, as the, the legal ramifications of uh, this war um, look to be uh, far reaching and really even sort of game changing in a number of fields. Um, and one of those prominent fields there is obviously EU law. It's on the doorstep, um, and there are lots of uh, close connections there. So this is what we're going to be exploring to, uh, today. And um, I'm delighted to be joined by three real experts in EU law uh, to help this conversation uh, along. Um, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to briefly introduce them now in succession and then give you a couple of, sort of give you a bit of information of how the event uh, is going to unfold. And then we're going to kick off. Um, but so our speakers are in order of appearance, uh, Julia Gentile, and Julia is an LSE Law Fellow uh, who's joined us from Maastricht University, I believe. Yes, where she was postdoctoral fellow uh, and also a lecturer. Julia had a lot of her uh, training and education uh, just across the road in King's College London. Uh, and in addition to all her impressive academic work on the EU law, constitutional issues, citizenship, etc., cetera, um, she also uh, has uh, experience in legal practice, is admitted to the uh, Italian bar. So um, she has uh, a broad range of insights to bring. And then next to her, um, our second speaker is Jan Zielinski. And Jan is a colleague of ours uh, at uh, the law school as well. He is an assistant professor of law. He uh, is joined, has joined us uh, from the University of Oxford. I think Jan, you've also, you know, he's got lots of big names on his uh, resume. He's also done, I think, a visiting researcher stint at um, uh, Yale, was it? Yale Law School. Um, and Jan, again, an expert on EU law, EU constitutional legal issues, et cetera, and also internal market, and, principles of, of, of general principles of EU law. Um, and Julia, by the way, Julia will be addressing the sanctions primarily, the sanctions that the EU has imposed. And Jan, you will be looking at the kind of national dynamics, the kind of way member states feed into the process, et cetera, and maybe also a little bit about football, because that's, <laughs> you know, we, we sport is important. Um, and then last but not least, we have Flores de Vita. Flores is an associate professor um, at the LSE Law School. And I'm sure that Flores also has uh, an important pedigree elsewhere, but Flores is a bit of an LSE addict. He's been here, you know, as a, as a fellow, as a, you were already here as a PhD student for part of the time, I think, doing, uh, doing work. So we've had Flores with us and we've benefited from his wisdom on matters such as EU law and particularly also issues of citizenship and EU ident and, and identity uh, for a number of years. And Flores is going to, going to round out the conversation by looking at the broader picture of how is this war changing basically the politics, the law and politics of the EU generally. Um, okay, so those are the three presentations that we have. Our speakers are going to all aim for 10 minutes, which hopefully will keep them properly within the 15 minutes ballpark. Um, and after that, we're going to have a QA. Um, and with the QA, you know, first of all, I'm going to take a couple of questions at, at, each, uh, at each time, and then we'll uh, turn back to the panel uh, for discussion. Um, the usual kind of rules apply in that, please, you know ask questions, don't, this is not the, the right venue to start monologuing. Um, there are other, there are plentiful other venues for that on social media, et cetera. So please keep your questions short and pity and to the point. Um, and then the second request, and this is one that's a little bit more, I think, tailored to this particular event. You know, I would uh, request that we all 
adopt some, some version of a veil of ignorance in the sense that we don't know what the background is, what the experiences have been, uh, what the family relations are of the people sitting around us, sitting next to us. Please be sensitive to that, be, uh, be aware of these and in how you kind of express yourself. So be aware of the fact that, you know, we, uh, we, want, we want here to have a sort of convivial and a productive sharing of you and a productive debate. Uh, and we all have to feel comfortable in that debate and that's important. Um, okay, and with that, I think those are the key uh, points for me to mention. Uh, so without further ado, we're gonna kick off and Julia, I'm, I'm happy to give you the floor. Thank you, thank you very much, Merve, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so when discussing with Floris and Jan about issues to cover uh, today, the list was already uh, extremely long. Uh, but I believe that, um, uh, interestingly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, is going to uh, become even longer. Uh, but today, as, as anticipated already by, by Verle, uh, I'm going to cover in particular two uh, matters. So sanctions um, and this is uh, something that we will explore from different aspects. So uh, I will briefly touch upon their adopt adoption, their effectiveness, and also uh, future legal questions that are arising from uh, the sanctions that have been um, imposed on, on Russia as a result of the conflict in Ukraine. And then I will move on to uh, humanitarian aid. So we will explore uh, briefly what has been the role and the action of the European Union in this respect, how the European Union is uh, supporting uh, Ukraine to face uh, the conflict. So of course, uh, it goes without saying, I will be adopting a, a ULO uh, perspective. So um, uh, of course, this is a, a partial perspective, one can say. So we need to bear uh, this uh, in mind. So um, I'll start with, with sanctions then. So just by, um, by way of a brief introduction, what, what are sanctions? So sanctions are measures that consist mostly of restrictions on trade, investment, restriction on investment, or also travel bans for individuals. Um, and these are tools that are pivotal for uh, the EU foreign uh, policy. So the EU uses sanctions, uses restrictive measures to pursue the fundamental values uh, that underpin uh, the EU legal order, but in particular the EU foreign policy. And these values include also the rule of law. Um, these measures are issued following the adoption of a decision by the Council. The Council of, um, acts in this context by unanimity. And then based on this decision, uh, there would be a regulation that is adopted again by the Council, but on the basis of qualified majority. And the legal basis for uh, these, these measures are Article 29 TU uh, and Article 215 TFU. Uh, but nevertheless, this doesn't mean that if there are measures that are not covered by uh, these uh, provisions that the European Union cannot uh, adopt them. So restrictive measures can also go beyond the remit, for example, of, of Article 215 TFU. So uh, what about the sanctions uh, imposed on Russia? So uh, as a general comment, as a general overview, I think that it is uh, quite accurate to say that the European Union has been quite um, swift and prompt in adopting these, uh, these measures. And in fact, uh, we can count four packages uh, adopted in the uh, context of a very, uh, I would say, um, uh, complex moment and also in a very short time frame. So the first package was adopted on the 23rd of February 2022. And uh, this package includes um, uh, some measures that were adopted in particular as a result of uh, the Russia decision to recognize independence of the non-government controlled areas of Donetsk and Lusansk um, oblasts. And in particular, the package includes uh, sanctions against 351 members of the Russian state Duma who voted in favor of this recognition, uh, but also restriction on economic relations with non-government controlled area of the Donetsk and Lusansk oblasts. Uh, and more in general, also restrictions uh, to access to the EU capital and financial uh, markets. Then the second package came uh, quite shortly after, on 25th of February 2022, and this package includes sanctions directly imposed on uh, Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, and its foreign affairs minister, Sergei Lavrov, uh, in response to the military aggression carried out by the Russian Federation against uh, Ukraine. 
Um, the EU imposed also restrictive measures on the members of the National Security Council of the Russian Federation and on the remaining members of the Russian state of Duma, who supported Russia recognition of the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Luzgan's republics. Um, the Council has agreed also on a further package on, um, uh, uh, of, of individual and economic restrictive measures, and these include um, uh, finance, energy, transport, and technology sectors of um, Russia, as well as um, visa policies. Uh, then the third and fourth package uh, move on, and um, uh, in my view, have been uh, quite um, uh, remarkable, quite, quite bold, one can say, because um, in particular, the third package adopted on the 28th of February, so uh, three days after the, the previous one, include a swift ban for seven Russian banks. Um, and we should say that uh, this, this kind of uh, sanction has been adopted uh, by the European Union only in 2012. So this is the second time that the European Union has adopted this kind of, um, of measure in uh, 2012 against uh, Uganda. Um, another measure is the suspension of the broadcasting of, uh, in the EU of state-owned media Russia Today and Sputnik. And, I will um, spend a few words on, on this measure in particular because it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, and then again, uh, other measures of individual nature, of economic nature against also Belarus. Um, and finally, a ban on the transactions with the Russian Central Bank. And finally, we have the fourth package adopted just a few days ago on the 2nd of, uh, of March 2022. Uh, which uh, builds on uh, the third package and expands uh, the restriction on um, uh, financial transactions through SWIFT. Uh, SWIFT, as, as you might know, I haven't said it uh, because I was giving it as, as, um, as well known, but SWIFT is the main uh, um, uh, way, which is the main uh, instrument that is used for financial transactions on a global level. And in fact, uh, Russian transactions through SWIFT account for 1.5% of the global uh, number of transactions carried uh, through SWIFT. Um, but the restriction of this fourth package also includes also um, uh, um, uh, limitations on the export of marine navigation and radio communication technology to Russia uh, and prohibition on transaction with the Central Bank of Belarus. So having had uh, this, this uh, overview uh, on, on the sanctions, I would like to spend a few words on their adoption, their effectiveness, and also future legal uh, questions that we will be dealing with. So starting from adoption, well, um, as I already briefly mentioned, I think that we can agree uh, that we can converge with the view that the European Union has been rather swift in adopting these, these measures. Um, however, uh, there has been, uh, generally speaking, uh, before uh, reaching an agreement on these measures, some, some discussion and also some um, of course, uh, divergence uh, in the position of the different member states. So, for example, uh, the Guardian reported that at a meeting of the leaders of the G7 group of nation on uh, the 24th of February 2022, only um, Canada supported a call for, um, uh, for a swift ban against uh, Russia. Um, but uh, and then some other member states, such as Netherlands, Germany, Cyprus and Italy, were, were more cautious in this respect. Uh, but nevertheless, an agreement was, was achieved on the 26th of February 2022. So overall, uh, one can say that uh, in spite of the complexity of the situation and also the different views of the member states uh, regarding the, uh, the operations of, of Russia uh, in Ukraine, there has been some, some unity. So in a way, the European Union, we could say, came, came uh, quite strengthened out of um, this, um, this process, the adoption of sanctions. What about effectiveness of sanctions? Well, this is a topic that has been extensively discussed. So there is um, uh, a substantive amount of literature uh, written in this uh, respect. Uh, and the evidence in this respect is, is quite um, contradicting in the sense that, uh, well, uh, sanctions are considered to be um, quite ineffective uh, by the majority of, of scholars. Nevertheless, when it comes to sanctions adopted against uh, Russia, um, on the 3rd of March, uh, uh, Reuters, uh, a Reuters article reported that the sanctions are starting having an effect on Moscow stock exchange market. In particular, the Russian Central Bank had to double his interest rate to 20%. So it seems that uh, there is some evidence of effects of, of these uh, sanctions against Russia. 
Uh, but I think we can be quite confident in saying that um, sanctions won't have any needed short-term effect. Rather, in my view, the effect of sanctions will be tested in, in the long term um, when it comes to the uh, economy of, of, of Russia. Um, and in particular, talking about sanctions, uh, I would like to focus briefly on, on the ban of Russia today and Sputnik. So this is a very peculiar uh, sanction that has been adopted uh, against uh, Russia on the 2nd of March 2022, and uh, basically consists in the banning of broadcasting activities by these two media uh, outlets uh, that have been instrumental um, in uh, in the propaganda uh, for war against um, uh, against Ukraine. So to my knowledge, this is the very first time that a sanction um, takes this form uh, where um, uh, uh, media uh, outlets, media, uh, media um, uh, entities from other states have been um, uh, prevented from broadcasting in the territory of the European Union. So there is, an internal effect based on this sanction. So it's a sanction imposed on um, third country entities, but then the sanction applies in the territory of the European Union. Um, we should say that this sanction is not, uh, one can say, so innovative in the sense that other member states had already banned some uh, Russia, um, uh, uh, Russian media. For example, since 2015, Lithuania and Latvia have suspended the broadcasting of the Russian language television channel RTR Planet uh, multiple times. And this decision was approved both by the Commission uh, and later on in the Baltic Media Alliance case, European Court of Justice recognized that countering incitement to hatred on account of nationality in the form of propaganda for war constitute a legitimate public policy objective. So it seems that uh, the Court of Justice is considered as um, as a valid justification uh, that of um, countering uh, propaganda for war by way of imposing uh, sanctions. Um, uh, now, I think that the imposition of this sanction by the European Union signals in a way that uh, the European Union protects its internal, its internal democracies from misinformation that may hinder the very core of the founding values of, of the European Union, which include indeed also democracy. Um, and in this sense, the balance uh, that had to be struck in this context uh, between freedom of expression that is protected under a number of, of instruments, such as the Charter of Fundamental Rights, Article 11, thereof, but also the European Convention of Human Rights versus internal security, well, has tilted in, in favor of, uh, of the second of, of internal security. Um, broadly understood. So uh, in particular, Article 11 of, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, we should uh, recall, can be subject to limitation. So uh, the restriction on fundamental, uh, um, on the fundamental freedom of expression is provided for uh, by the Charter itself. And we should, uh, we should also uh, mention that Article 52 specifies that any limitation imposed uh, on fundamental rights in the European Union must be, pro must be provided for by law and respect the essence of those rights and freedoms. Uh, subject to the principle of proportionality, limitations may be made only if they are necessary and genuinely meet objectives of general interest recognized by the Union or the need to protect the rights and freedom of others. And it seems to me that both the general interest test and proportionality are uh, met here in this context. Now, future uh, questions before we move to uh, CJ. If you, if you want to still cover a bit of humanitarian yes. aid, yes. sure, that sure, 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 absolutely. Minutes, like, sure, OK, minutes. sure, absolutely. So um, uh, humanitarian aid then. So uh, I won't talk about the litigation of the sanctions, um, which I think is a very interesting question because there is the issue of whether Russia can actually uh, challenge as an intervener um, to these sanctions. But what about humanitarian aid? So that's a field that is um, quite um, uh, interesting from a EULO perspective in the sense that it is a shared competence between the EU and the member states. So under Article 4, Paragraph 4, TFEU, we read that um, both the EU and member states can uh, adopt measures in this field. Uh, and this means in particular that the European Union has a um, supportive and a coordinative, um, coordinating role in this field. Uh, the main legal basis for humanitarian aid uh, is in particular Article 2014 TFU, which tells us that 
precisely the union measures and those of the member states should complement and reinforce uh, each other. Um, any measure adopted in this field um, should be taken on the basis of the legislative uh, procedure, ordinary legislative procedure, and the Commission has a coordinating role in this respect. So any measure that is adopted in this field, in the field of uh, humanitarian aid by the European Union, shall respect uh, the principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence, and is delivered um, uh, uh, very often through uh, the UN uh, agencies, non-governmental actions, uh, non-governmental organizations, and international committee of the Red Cross. So uh, what about uh, the situation in Ukraine then? So we should mention, first of all, that uh, since 2014, the European Union has been already active in granting humanitarian aid to, to Ukraine. Um, and this meant uh, in a way that the EU had already some instruments in place for uh, supporting the situation in Ukraine. But what is quite uh, interesting is that uh, what has been uh, used uh, in order to um, uh, facilitate um, uh, humanitarian support in favor of Ukraine um, has been Regulation uh, 2021. 832 on uh, the uh, Union Civil Protection Mechanism. And this is, interestingly, a regulation that has been adopted in 2021 uh, to face um, uh, the challenges of COVID. So an internal um, instrument, this regulation that concerns therefore how member states should uh, deal with the internal crisis, in particular in this context, COVID, has been used uh, externally towards uh, uh, Ukraine. So in this field, we can um, <laughs> mention different um, uh, different measures that have been adopted, in particular disbursement of significant um, uh, 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 amount of, of uh, money towards Ukraine. Um, the financial value of this assistance is estimated well above uh, 100 million euros, uh, but the assistance uh, from uh, the EU has consisted also in medical uh, stockpile uh, of the financial value of 10 million and uh, generally uh, also support in terms of, of staff, uh, humanitarian staff sent by uh, the European Union. Now I'm not going to cover the cohesion action for refugees in Europe because I think that Floris is going to, uh, to cover this, uh, but I think that what is uh, particularly interesting now uh, concluding um, is that, um, well, the measures that exist in the field of humanitarian aid that are intrinsically external in nature in the sense that they are directed towards third countries might have a spillover effect in a way in the management of emergencies within the European Union. And it would be interesting, therefore, to, uh, to see how, um, how this aid also will impact, uh, the external aid will impact in a way on the finances, the internal finances of, of the Eurozone. And in particular, what is also quite interesting is the emergence of a notion of solidarity, not only internal, but also um, external. So um, I will conclude here. Thank you uh, very much. And I look forward to, to, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. You've already given us an awful lot to think about. Um, you've also made me, you've also reminded me of the fact that my colleagues always have so much to say that it might be a little bit difficult to discipline them. So we're going to do a little version of musical chairs. I'm going to move here. I'm going to sit next to Jan. And then after you've finished, I'm going to move right next to you. <laughs> All right. Okay. I yeah. start. You start. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so as Verla has um, said um, at the start, um, I want to say a few words about the national and the cultural dynamics that have been feeding into the use response that Julia started to describe. Floris is going to speak about it um, in a second. And I think it's important because um, what we're often seeing happening at the EU level um, ultimately has roots and what's happening at, um, in, at the member state level, and sometimes even outside state structures. Um, it has to do with something that non-state actors do. And I think a good place to start is Germany and Germany's policy shift, which has received a lot of media coverage here in the UK, but also internationally. Um, Germany is the EU's largest member state. It, it is its uh, economically most powerful member state. Um, so it really matters what uh, Germany does on issues like that. And what we've seen um, during the first weekend after the invasion was a really quite fundamental policy shift on um, many issues. Chancellor Olaf Scholz has called this 
um, a Zeitenwende. It's it's a term. It's quite difficult to translate. It's a, it's a era change, a turn of eras, a turning point, but it has much more gravitas really um, in uh, German. So something quite monumental is um, is happening here, and um, and and there's many dimensions of this Zeitenwende, but I think the core ones of interest um, for discussion here are the military aspect and the energy um, aspect. So on the military side, for historical reasons, um, Germany has firmly rejected the idea that its uh, arms and weapons could be used against Russian soldiers. And that, of course, is the result of World War II. This, um, this is still a specter, um, which is sometimes hard to understand for non-Germans, but it's uh, it's it's a fear, it's a danger that's looming large in lots of um, Germans' minds. So um, here we've seen a, um, a real fundamental policy shift after this um, supplying of, I think, 5,000 helmets for which Germany was rightly uh, ridiculed in the international community. Uh, the chancellor has committed to um, provide Ukrainians with proper military equipment. Um, so that's the first big change. The other uh, big change concerns um, its funding uh, of, of, of Germany's military, of the, of the Bundeswehr, which um, is notoriously underfunded. And um, this has been pointed out by many um, allies of Germany. The 2% of GDP threshold of NATO was never really reached in, in recent history. Um, Chancellor Scholz has announced that he's going to change that too. Actually, he's going to exceed that, um, that threshold. And why I think it matters is that having a Germany, um, which always been, has been a bit of a sleeping giant, or some people called a reluctant uh, superpower in terms of geopolitics, awakening in that sense, it might have a really strong impact on EU policymaking. Um, we know from the past that, um, especially in federal polities, uh, crises often have this centralizing effect. They lead to centralization um, at, the, at the heart of the policy. So this could really um, have some spillover um, effects. Now on energy, I'm, I'm just gonna say that um, uh, Germany is much more reliant on, on Russian gas um, than many other uh, European member states. Um, and here too, we are gonna see change. We don't yet know um, what this change is gonna look like. Um, but the infamous Nord, Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been um, first suspended, now I think effect, effectively stopped. Um, Germany is going to try to uh, loosen up or, or lower its dependence on, on Russian gas. But um, here we have yet to see um, how that um, really happens and, and through which means. Now, second, second point I want to mention is the role of Central Eastern Europe in this conflict, and this has received far less media attention. Countries like uh, Poland, the Baltic states, Slovakia, Hungary are geographically very close to the conflict, but they're also historically, culturally very close to the conflict, and therefore within the EU are going to be um, the most affected uh, member states, um, no matter what happens in the war. And the relationship between Central Eastern Europe and the EU over the past few years has been incredibly difficult. Um, I think it started with the uh, strong backlash against the EU's refugee allocation policy in 2015-2016, then came the rule of law crisis, the political changes in Hungary and Poland. Now uh, we have a COVID relief fund, but Hungary and Poland's national recovery plans haven't been uh, approved. I could go on. Um, this war is happening um, right when, when things have gotten really um, unpleasant. And um, still what we ended up seeing since the start of the invasion is that heads of state in the region, and here's especially uh, Polish PM uh, Morawiecki, have taken the lead, um, have um, pushed for uh, EU measures, have planned and coordinated um, EU measures. This is, this is an active policy shaping role we haven't um, seen in a while, maybe um, ever, uh, actually, um, since these countries joined the EU. In, in my opinion, this, um, this situation probably brings a few 
promises, um, but it also carries some risks. So I want to speak about the promise first, and it's, it's precisely that, that we see an awakening, a, a regional awakening, so to say, that um, uh, Easter, Central Eastern European uh, policymakers are more actively involved with what's happening at the EU level in a constructive way, not just in a destructive way. Um, and that might also um, mean, uh, looking at the other side of things, that the Western European member states will take these positions a bit more seriously. And it, it's, it, I, I don't think it gives anyone any pleasure to say this, but what's been happening since um, for the past 14 days is exactly what the leaders of all of these member states have been saying for three decades. And it was ridiculed by almost every single Western European member state. So um, there must be some, some shifts here. And I think they're, they're both from the side of Central Eastern Europe, but also, um, also on the other um, side of the conversation. There are also some risks, um, and very briefly here, I think one major risk, and again, kind of sitting um, here in Britain, in the in the west of Europe, but also in the it's an odd expression, but the global west uh, for, for this uh, purpose, um, there's a risk of uh, lumping these countries together, um, and they are very very different. Um, Poland's uh, stance on Russia has been always incredibly critical, um, of course, for historical reasons, but this has carried on um, through recent times too. Hungary has developed over the past 10 years a real privileged um, a relationship with Russia and uh, Putin. Um, I've just uh, listened to a Hungarian media expert on um, Saturday saying that apparently uh, the Hungarian um, state news is um, running apologetic um, broadcasts about the war, saying that, you know, it's, it's not really Russia's fault. It's there's um, Ukraine who's provoked that and, and, and the EU as such. So um, between Poland and Hungary, there's a massive difference. And then we have all the other um, states, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, who are in between these two extremes. So um, so this is a diverse um, this is a diverse space politically. Um, the other thing is that um, in this um, initial um, feeling of um, unity and, 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 and justified unity, I guess, at new level, uh, we risk forgetting that we are still dealing um, to a large extent with authoritarian rulers. Um, uh, Poland and Hungary, um, although they've now taken, a, especially Poland, this positive role, um, the political situation within Poland hasn't changed. You know, the, the, the stuff that we've been decrying, the corruption, the rule of law crisis, the, the curtailing of democratic institutions are still there. And this is gonna be an incredibly tough thing to navigate for the EU. Because on the one hand, you need to have these countries and these uh, political leaders on board. On the other hand, um, you cannot um, compromise or, or lose the perspective of protecting um, the rule of law, of protecting uh, corruption, um, et cetera. Um, the final uh, thing I wanna uh, speak to is, um, and I've said this at the start, is the involvement of um, non-state actors. And this I think um, is something which everybody um, immediately realized that this time around something was different. We had loads of private companies, we had lots of civil society organizations and other regional organizations taking a very strong stance, which is quite unusual. We haven't seen that in previous conflicts, even in, you know, in re recent history. And I wanna pick one example, um, which just happens to be a, an area that I know uh, best, but I think it's also quite symbolic of what's happening and that's football. Um, FIFA and UEFA have adopted sanctions on the first weekend of the um, invasion. And uh, what they've done is they've um, issued a joint statement uh, in which they've declared that their solidarity with uh, Ukraine and its people, but then also, and that's, that's the operate, operative part, so to say, they've announced that all Russian teams, whether national club teams, are suspended from participation in international competitions until further notice. The two um, notable targets of these sanctions so far are the Russian national team, who won't be playing Poland, you know, of all teams in their World Cup qualifiers, and there's Spartak Moscow, who won't be playing in the uh, round of last 16 in the Europa League. And 
to clarify, FIFA and UEFA are not EU institutions. They're autonomous um, football governing bodies. So this is coming independently for them. And the strong reaction is quite unusual. We, we haven't seen um, anything like that in the past. Um, UEFA and FIFA are traditionally extremely reluctant to take any political stance in any conflict um, in Europe and outside of Europe. And that's for, um, for a fundamental reason. They have in their statutes committed themselves to political neutrality. And this is the idea, of course, that um, sport is ideology free, that sport is a platform where people from opposing sides can come together and, you know, fight it out through peaceful means on the football pitch or whatever uh, it is that you do. Because of this commitment, um, it's not actually quite clear whether as a matter of law, FIFA and UEFA can um, adopt these sanctions. So, so far what uh, we understand, we, we've not seen official documents here, but um, it seems that um, they have relied on the so-called false uh, majeure clause, so the unexpected circumstances clause. But the, the fundamental problem is um, here that um, you don't really have a provision in the UEFA or FIFA statutes which says if one of the member countries invades another um, state or, um, or initiates an, uh, a war of aggression, you can throw them out of competitions. So we'll see there's, there's some creative uh, legal thinking around this topic where uh, people have suggested um, UEFA and FIFA have also committed themselves to pretty few human rights. So maybe that can be a counter uh, weighing um, principle. But legally speaking, it's a, it's a different territory we're entering. And, and I don't think that's even the most interesting uh, question is, and, and here's where I'm, I'm going to stop. I think this is just a, um, if anything, it's, it's, a, it's one out of many, many examples where um, a non-state actor has taken a stance in this conflict. And the, the effect of this might be symbolic, but um, what I think we're seeing over the past two weeks is that there can also be a cumulative um, effect once notes and notes of um, entities, companies, organizations are starting doing that and um, the world of football is, um, is part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, um, and also for the punctuality. Nevertheless, I'm still going to make you some <laughs> thought I might uh, escape that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Viola. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Fia and um, Julia as well. It's nice to see so many people, so many students uh, of mine in the room as well. Uh, I also saw lots of names of former students on Zoom. Uh, so nice to see you in a way again. Um, so I'll conclude with some thoughts on sort of the bigger picture, I guess. So what this has done to the EU so far in the last two weeks, but also in the longer term, because there's some developments that have started, which were like, which are likely to accelerate in the coming months and years and will really define the EU in the coming decades. Um, so first of all, I think it's very important to say that um, I think it's difficult to overstate how much the EU owes Ukraine and the Ukrainians and their defense of values that have long been considered central to Europe and the EU, because I think it has given the EU the, the power and the motivation to also stand up for these um, values in much of it's done in the last two weeks. And, much of the way it's starting to rethink its own, um, its own DNA and the, the parts that are central to what makes the EU. Um, so in a one way, the EU is used to crises. We've had a crisis every two, three years over the last decade and a half. Um, those of you who have studied the EU also know that the EU is not very good at dealing with crises, at least not initially. It takes a while to get going, partially it's due to uh, internal disagreements. You need to, particularly in external affairs, every member state on board. And member states have different interests, different alliances with different member states. Big powers, global powers play off these member states against each other because they know that makes renders the EU incapable. So we're used to understanding the EU as an actor that has some power internally, but is relatively weak externally. There's even, I think, a Twitter handle, which is quite popular, that is, uh, is EU concerned? Mm -hmm which collects all the statements by the institutions of being gravely concerned and deeply concerned and significantly concerned. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the EU does in external affairs. That's what they can agree on. Much further, they, they don't really go much further um, most of the time. This time is different. This time is 
the EU has done something that it hasn't ever done. It has moved in a weekend. It has moved through a number of taboos. It has moved forward decades worth of institutional um, changes and commitments. And there's a really nice saying in Dutch that translates literally as jumping over one's shadow. And that's what the EU has done. It has jumped across in one, one go. It has just sort of got rid of its self-image, get rid of its understanding, and just move to something else and recast itself. And it has done so, uh, I think, quite impressively. And it can really, you can really see now that the EU is, in fact, becoming a geopolitical actor. And this is not something that started this week or last weekend. This is something that people had anticipated was necessary for the EU. Uh, Luc van Middelaar, who those of you who do L222 remember from the first weeks, quite an influential thinker on EU in the EU space and widely read by people involved. Last year wrote a piece on the geopolitical union that we need to start thinking about the strategic interests of the EU and what that requires the EU to do and to be and how to transform itself. Macron has been uh, beating his drum ever since he got elected. He got really frightened seeing what Trump did to the US and the US relation to the EU, making him realize that the EU needs a capacity to sustain itself in different ways, including militarily. And, um, but all these processes that were sort of, they were undercurrents moving in that direction. So we've seen a big fund for the EU to manufacture its own chips, microchips. We've seen a 300 billion investment in Africa to try to sort of get the Chinese influence uh, a bit away and get the European influence uh, there. So we've seen the start of this geopolitical reality emerging. But the last two weeks, this has been sort of unprecedented. So we've heard from Julia, some of the measures have been taken, the sanctions, the SWIFT ban, ban on the, European, on the Russian Central Bank. There's a Ukraine recovery plan that's now being uh, discussed up to the tune of 1.2 billion um, for the recovery of uh, Ukraine. There's 450 million of military, direct military aid, which the EU has never done. This goes on top of the military aid by the independent member states using a mechanism that has never been used, an off-budget peace, peace facility. Again, never used. There's a commitment now to reduce Russian gas by 80% by the end of this year. Again, this would have taken, without this war, we've taken decades to get that far. And tomorrow and Friday, the EU leaders are meeting in Versailles, very powerful imagery there. <clears throat> and word on the street is that the big proposal by Macron and the commission, we've clearly been talking about this, I'm going to present it as a joint proposal, is a repower EU fund to the tune of at least 200 billion. It's 200 billion that member states can use, the commission can disperse to member states, and member states can use to create strategic independence in energy and military independence. So this is really something, again, unprecedented, the central borrowing from the EU to the member states to make sure that in military terms, food terms as well, and energy terms, they're no longer dependent on outside states that might use this power to uh, leverage the EU or prevent the EU from taking certain steps. So what does all this mean? So that's, the, that's what's happened so far. But what does it mean for the EU and for the EU in the longer term specifically? So I think the EU received many compliments on the speed and the unity and the effectiveness of its move so far, especially, of course, relative to it, its weakness prior to um, the, Russia, the Russian invasion. But I think this indicates quite some significant shifts in the EU's uh, understanding and the functioning. So the first one is that I think this is an important moment for the EU's purpose and its sense of meaning and identity. I think for those of you who followed uh, the EU courses, we start in week one with a question, what is the EU for? And this was a question that was easily answered 40, 50, 60 years ago. You know, prevent war in Europe between European states, prosperity, internal markets. But those two projects sort of lost their appeal, partially because they've been so successful at it. We, can't, we, we don't think that France and Germany are gonna have a war at the EU ends, or that we're gonna be all poor at one EU ends. So the EU is not necessary for that anymore. So over the past, decade or so, we've seen attempts of the EU to make itself relevant again. And it's been very unsuccessful at that, actually. It's tried to do so by thinking of what the citizens want, what do they need, healthcare abroad, the cheap phone bills when they call somewhere else. You know, when your Ryanair flight is late, he gets some money back. You know, these were pr promised us, you know, we'll bring the EU back to the citizens. Well, now we have 
the start of two projects that makes the EU indispensable for its member states and citizens and are widely supported by them as well. So one is the energy transition, the Green Deal that started last year, that the Commission is very, very smartly embedding in all the recovery plans. So the recovery from the COVID plan, 750 billion, can be used by member states, but only if it's used to green the economy. The new MUTI that we'll be discussing in the coming days, Repower EU, same incredible amount of money that member states can use almost for free. But they have to be used for green economies, for making them energy independent from oil and gas by Russia and other member states. So we now see these ideas of the EU serves for this energy transition, and it also serves to protect the interests of the member states and Europeans in a geopolitical sense in this scary world. We need a strong, smart, active, strategic EU. So the EU is pivoting, I think, and this will become more, more visible, I think, in the coming months and years, as presenting itself as being a central actor for these kind of projects. So it's no longer there necessarily for sort of the internal markets and to facilitate interaction between the member states internally, but to present a block externally for bigger projects, be it climate change or um, the geopolitical realities in the world. This also comes with a shift in institutional power. So again, we see the stars of some changes that will probably become bigger and bigger. The big winner so far on the EU side, if that's an appropriate term in this context, are Emmanuel Macron, who is doing uh, the status as uh, shot up incredibly, both as someone who can engage directly personally with both sides of the conflict, but also as someone whose vision, basically he has been right for years. This is vindicating his vision as much as the vision of many of the Eastern European, um, like Central Eastern European states, their vision of the role of Europe in the world and the dangers to that role. The other big winner is, has been the commission that until a few years ago was really relegated as a minor institution, as an agent of the member states, powerful interests of the member states and the European Parliament as the embodiment of the citizens. The commission has played an absolute blinder in this, uh, in this crisis. It has all the measures that we've discussed have come out of the chamber of the commission They've been very fast, they've been very smart at pressuring member states and leveraging the member states to get things done. And the most painful reform for the EU in the next 30 years, the energy transition that's going to cost a lot of money to member states and to citizens, has for a large extent been uh, brought forward in these two really, really big funds, the, the next generation EU funds, 750 billion, now another fund is being discussed in the coming weeks, which will, looks like it's going to be at least 200 billion, mm -hmm. which is going to take the big sting out of this energy transition for many member states and for the EU as well. So it's really, really smart um, moving from the Commission that really sees itself as playing a much more important role in these external um, strategies that the EU might have. The losers so far has have been uh, Charles Michel, I don't know if you even heard of this guy, the um, president of the um, European Council, that looks like a very sort of powerful position in bringing the members, heads of the member states together. He's really been practically absent and really um, overshadowed by Macron and von der Leyen. And the European Parliament. The European Parliament has, particularly in all these external questions, very little power, legally speaking. So it's becoming a very sort of symbolic actor in this space. Important, but more symbolic than uh, as a crucial uh, institution making making of course. Now, internally, all these shifts also mean something for us as lawyers, as presume many of us are. So we've taught you for the past year that the EU is predominantly something that happens through law. We integrate through law. The internal market are legal rules you can't escape. The crisis, the way we solve problems with Hungary and Poland is through law. That's the way we can get, we get European integration done. Now, the two big projects for the EU in the coming decades are not law, are the Green Deal and the geopolitical strategy. And both will be accomplished through money. Both will be accomplished through debt mutualization between member states and paying off those that are reluctant and 
subsidizing those constituencies within member states or within a citizenry that have to bear the cost of these changes. So that's a very, very important transition for the EU. There's always seen itself as a legal institution, now it's becoming much more a traditional political actor, state actor that buys compliance uh, as well as forces it into it. So if I'd have to speculate what this means for the EU, it means a lot more conditionality. So things will, member states will get money if they do X, Y, Z, green their economy, commit to the rule of law, whatever it might be. So that will be a much more important strategy for the EU to get things done. In external affairs, we'll see a loss of vetoes. We've seen now that you can act quickly and can have a meaningful impact for goods in the rest of the world, which will come at a cost of member states losing vetoes in many of these external questions. And it will come, and the third development that is likely to happen is that we see that crises in the EU will now be solved by debt mutualization, something that until two years ago was absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible for Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland to commit to funding a European project. We've now seen it twice. The COVID crisis was solved that way. This crisis is likely to be solved that way, solved, helped that way. So this has now become a go-to response for the EU in these crisis situations, which completely changes the picture of identity and solidarity across member states as well. Now, all of this was impossible a year ago, two years ago. There's a lot of momentum now. So I think the next few months will be a, a sort of solid, solidification of what's happened and institutionalization of these powers. And uh, I think in the longer term, we will really see a shift in what the EU is about. Now, I have two minutes left. Since Bill is sitting next to me, I can't escape that. So one minute on the refugee situation and one minute on the uh, Ukraine accession. We've seen over two million people cross into the EU since two weeks ago. Again, the EU's response has been incredibly fast. What they've done is that they've sort of resurrected the legislative agenda, a package that exists since 2001 that was drafted for the Balkan crisis, was never enacted. It's called the Temporary Protective Directive, Protection Directive, which allows the EU member states to sign off on essentially sort of generous conditions for entry and stay in the EU. So now for Ukrainians entering the EU, they can stay up to a year with housing benefits, medical insurance, the right to work and the right to live. This can be extended up to three years. Something absolutely unimaginable when the refugee crisis happened in the Middle East, of course. It's a complete different treatment, different commitment to how we treat um, these refugees. It's been very fast. It's been extended to third country nationals coming in from Ukraine which was a problem at the border initially because Ukrainians had visa fee travel in the EU already, so they could enter anyways, except that a South Korean living in Ukraine could not because of a different visa regime. Now, this directive allows all these people in anyways, so on the same conditions as Ukrainians, and really at the speed of light. So quite impressive. Again, the solution here will be buckets full of money will be thrown at the, the member states that have our housing and these refugees. The accession. Zelensky asked for accession, a very speed, fast accession. It will be discussed in the next two days in Versailles. In the meantime, Moldova and Georgia have also asked to be a member of the EU. This is not going to happen. Um, there's resistance for different reasons for member states. Uh, Ukraine or the other two don't meet the conditions for entry. There's particularly concern about the uh, corruption, level of corruption, and the validity of the democratic institutions. The EU having been burned in, uh, in Poland and Hungary is very reluctant to go too fast. These member states have to meet the acquis communautaire, which you all know is like thousands and thousands of directs and regulations need to be embedded in Ukrainian law before they can do so. But most importantly, now that the EU is a geopolitical actor, it understands also the geopolitical dangers of having membership of these countries. Because there's a lot of talk of NATO, but the EU also has a Self-defense clause. If one EU member state is attacked under Article 427, all member states have to respond, including NATO. So that is the main reason why there might be a symbolic gesture that we accept that they are potentially a candidate member, but it won't go further than that. Which doesn't mean that the EU is not interested in responding to Zelensky and Ukraine's call for commitment to the European project. And again, this is something that Macron has been trying to get done for years, trying to 
imagine an EU where we have a core EU, not 27, 15, 16, Eurozone, deep integration military, deep integration fiscally, and then a surrounding, we'll come up with a nice name, the European Association, whatever you have, of states that want to be part of the EU, but not really, which might include member states that are very different, might include Turkey, Ukraine, but also the UK, Switzerland, Norway, that for different reasons, want an anchor, want to be anchored to the EU, want access to its market, but don't want to go much further than that. So again, if I have to speculate about a longer term, this is again, a development that Russia's invasion of Ukraine seems to have sped up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Floris, and thank you to all the uh, speakers for really uh, extremely enlightening um, and brief discussions. I'm going to open the floor to questions. Um, and remember, short questions, please. Yes, open it. Um, one, I guess, like tendency that I detected was that this is somehow a moment of so can you speak up? Um, that this is somehow a moment of consolidation for the EU, which it, it is, doubtless. But at the same time, it, it seems to me that the EU always acts in a very reactionary way, which you've noted. And I think that part of the issue with Russia is, is EU enlargement and NATO enlargement. So how, how in, in your opinion, the panel's opinion, how is it that the EU and I guess the global West, so including Canada, the United States, et cetera, how could have this been avoided rather than looking at this crisis in a retrospective way, in a prospective way, what could have the EU done differently? All right, thank you very much. We're going to take a That's few an easy more. One. How could this have been avoided? <laughs> Listening to the Central European states. Um, okay, so that's one. Uh, uh, Joe? Yeah, um, we spoke quite a bit about the remilitarization of uh, particular member states, but also of the European Union as a whole. And um, that to some extent is an old story, right? The rapid reaction force was spoken about 20 years ago, and there's always been a drive and Macron's drive to uh, militarize Europe. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if the panel members think that that's an unqualified good, or if we need to be a little bit skeptical in the long run, that Europe is thinking along military lines, acting as a rival to NATO and collaboration with NATO, but it's not, I mean, this crisis notwithstanding, is this something to be welcomed or something to be wary of? Okay, we're going to take one more. Let's see. I've seen just okay. Um, I just wanted to ask on the because there was a point made of uh, we will see more uh, more debt mutual. Um, um, utilization in what regard we will need to anticipate um, constitutional courts reacting to that. I could see Karlsruhe having like a firm opinion on that and whether that will potentially yeah, be a point of strong contention in the future and how the EU should anticipate or deal with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let's try to be a little bit swift succinct also in the answers because i know that there's definitely a second round in here uh, and you're still um right so uh let's kick off with the, how could this have been avoided um Jan, maybe you wanna... yeah sure um yeah this is the one million dollar question i think um and i think part of the answer is to kind of maybe answer it from the wrong uh, side so Partly the hesitancy and the kind of the now cost benefit analysis we're seeing about sanctions, about putting pressure on Russia is um, that member states don't really, and not just EU member states, but countries across the world don't really quite know where to get their gas from otherwise. Um, you know, it's, I think that's a really banal but important, um, but important part of this. So um, I think. Yeah, this is not something you could have done over two, three years, or nor over five, but over 10, 20, 30 years. What definitely could have happened was um, a, um, yeah, a st strategic uh, independence and diversification of energy sources so that, you know, if one, one closes down, then another, um, you know, light can be switched off, so to say. But maybe even more importantly, and I, I know this is politically not entirely uncontroversial, but the, the green energy um, agenda, the, you know, the, I mean, people have been advocating this for, you know, what, half a century. And um, we could have done so much more, so much faster. And imagine um, if, um, 
you know, I don't know, Germany had 40, 50 percent of its energy from renewable uh, sources. Um, the response would look very different and the cost would be very different. The other thing is, and this goes a little bit into um, Joe's question already, is, is the defense aspect. And I, yeah, I, I, I do share um, your concerns. I don't think anyone is happy um, seeing this, um, this happening. Um, I do think that it's probably unavoidable to be perfectly honest, but um, in, in terms of Ukraine, in terms of the Baltic states, um, greater EU military and security cooperation, I think would have gone a long way just to kind of signal very early, well, this is a line you don't cross. And now thinking back, well, maybe in 2014, we should have been a bit more powerful in our response. Even I think more importantly in 2008, when no one really uh, took notice of what was happening in Georgia, maybe already that was a signaling moment when Putin was you know, at the Munich Security Conference kind of laying out um, his strategic priorities to say, oh no, we're gonna push back harder on this and then increase the costs for the Russian side to do that in the future. But um, yeah, there's a lot of ifs and buts in this, but I think these are, uh, from you know where I am standing would be two important parts of the response. Yeah, I was actually wondering, Julia, if you want to add something to that because I'm sure that like the sanctions are sort of like the the soft the soft end of the wedge and remilitarization, sure. the hard sure. end of the wedge, and how do they they relate? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, sanctions are uh, are really weaponizing the context of of the the conflict. Uh, Ukraine. So in a way, the European Union is using almost a, a war uh, language when it comes to uh, adopting uh, sanctions. And this is considered to be a, a way precisely to avoid militarization in a way. So using sanctions uh, and therefore measures that do not involve conflict is a way for the European Union to, to uh, not get into militarization. And I believe, and that's, that's uh, I think also clear that the European Union is quite wary about uh, this, this term. So um, it's true that projects on militarization of the European Union existed since uh, the defense, uh, uh, the common defense uh, project that existed in, in the, 50, the late 50s, uh, 60s. So, and this failed precisely because of the historical background of, of the European uh, Union. Um, and I think that the question of militarization is strictly linked with, with, with money again. So I, I support Floris on this in the sense that um, it's, it's, it's a choice about uh, budget and allocation of resources. And now if we look at the budgetary rules in the European Union, well, the budget of the European Union is very, is very um, uh, limited in a way if compared with, with budgets of, of states. Uh, so it means that militarization would require significant uh, input uh, of resources. And uh, so I think that, again, the, the, whether this will be a development boils down to, um, to money, supporting Floris, um, Floris point. Yeah. And with that, we're going to let everything boil down to money. We want to talk a bit about <laughs> <your that tagline>. <laughs> militarization. <laughs> no, but I think, I mean, I think Joe's point and also the first question really, I think, your questions indicate the answer in a way that the EU has not wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do this. Yeah. They're not in, they, they, it's, it's in a DNA to avoid these difficult questions, controversial questions on militarization and what if and how do we do that. So it's always tried to not have to think about that. Macron didn't want to do it before. Yeah. Yeah, but this is this is Macron. This is what when did he get elected? 2017. This is not this is a very short time span in the history of the EU. And part of the answer why. How did we get so far? Is that is that answer? That's the EU has never been comfortable in that position, and now it's been forced to do that, and with it, it will be forced to respond to these deeply controversial questions. Uh, do we want the European Army, and under which circumstances are we actually going to enter war? I mean, these are questions that we've always avoided when it comes to the EU, and now we'll have to start thinking about it again. On the um, on Karlsruhe, this shows how how much EU is law. That's, we immediately think, what is the German constitutional court going to think of our solution <laughs> to the <laughs> Russia crisis? But it's a very valid point. So the EU has uh, very good lawyers, the commission particularly. So how they've tried to get around Karlsruhe. So for those of you who don't know, German constitutional court has been very critical of the way in which the debt to Eurozone prices have been solved by giving the ECB, European Central Bank, lots of power to 
print money to uh, deal with um, the monetary side of things. So what they've done with the COVID crisis is fund of 750 billion. And what they'll do again, if this gets uh, adopted, is that this isn't something that the ECB does. It comes out of the own resources of the commission, which is a legal technicality. But because of that legal technicality, formally speaking, the member states and the member state central banks are not liable for the uh, costs. So it will be, it will be come up in Karlsruhe and in some other constitutional courts. But the argument against it is not as obvious as it was in ESM or in T or a quantity deal. All right, thank you. We're going to go through a second round now. We're going to take another uh, three or so questions. Uh, Gary? Yeah, I, I, can I slip two questions in here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe preface it with a comment, which is that, that Donald Trump had this habit of asking really good questions almost accidentally. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, about five years ago, he said, well, what, what exactly is the point of NATO? And it didn't seem like there was a very clear answer at that, at that juncture. Now there is. Uh, and in some ways, you seem to be answering a similar sort of, sort of question. But I have two other questions. One, one is... a uh, question a comment for Jan about football. Um, it strikes me, I, it's just as you were saying that, that, that FIFA and UEFA had, had been very apolitical, I started going through all these cases from the past and, and discovered or realized that in fact, it, the game had been highly politicized. Um, you know, we threw Yugoslavia out of the European championships. We have a World Cup in Qatar. And, and the example I'm really curious about was the case where um, um, the Soviet Union refused to play Chile in a World Cup qualifier after Allende was removed. Um, the Scottish football team disreputably did go to the stadium where the tortures were, were taking place to play a friendly, but the Soviet Union was then expelled from the World Cup as a result of that. So there's a kind of a counter history of politicization, which is rather interesting here. But my real question, was provoked by the screen where all these sort of Freudian comments kept yeah. coming up. So there, was, there were all sorts of mistranslations. What the vision of Europe was translated as the division of Europe. And at one point when somebody said the EU is not very good at dealing with crisis, it came up as the EU is not very good at dealing with Christ. And that got me, that got me thinking about the idea of the Antichrist because in 1917, um, the Kaiser was, was, was presented to us as a kind of Antichrist. And of course, two things happened. One is that we decided to set up an ad hoc tribunal for the crime of aggression to prosecute the, the Kaiser, who was the arch criminal of Europe and had engaged in this utterly unprovoked war that had nothing to do with inter-imperial rivalries or disarmament or the economic competition between states and Europe. And we have applied sanctions to Germany. Um, are we in a 1917 point in history? Another easy one. All right. Okay. So, 1917. Um, all right. I, I know there's another question out there, but there's. I'm first going to take your question. Um, just to keep it short. Um, given given the demand the demands of further integration that have been discussed, and how much more money and that it demands, what are the prospects for a fiscal union given the context in Ukraine? Prospects for a fiscal union. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Nice and pithy. David. Thank you, Ewan. Thank you all for really amazing conversation so um this goes so far as in a way to what extent are you concerned that your account of the future development in reaction to the invasion is too kind glossy really it seems they'll throw money at it it's it's going to happen through throw money at it you know it seems like there's so many barriers to to what you're describing in the way so uh, the mutualization of of the cost of this so i don't think that is clear right we're just coming out of COVID balance sheets of many member states are in a really bad way. Can we be sure that even rich countries whose balance sheets are in a bad way will, will indeed mutualize debt? I'm, I'm not sure. Are we sure that, that, that member states will buy into um, the nuclearization of power that might be needed to make this, uh, this happen? So uh, there seems to be a lot of really significant barriers. So I'm wondering whether you're too fantastic. And then the second question I had was, so I'm taking Gary's point. These are actually two questions, not six. Um, um, in relation to the militarization of Europe, I'm not sure how it's going to work. Right? Most member states are small countries. 
spending three or four percent of GDP on 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 the, on the military is not going to be able to enable them to provide independent, uh, powerful enough militaries to defend themselves. It has to be mutualized as well. But it's not clear to me how that can happen. And that that also seems to me to be such a significant barrier to what you describe. Right. Okay. So lots of. Uh, questions that actually sort of allude to potential barriers for this this kind of new vision of Europe to 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 materialize. Um, would anyone like to kick off with one of uh, Gary's embarrassment of <laughs> riches? I mean, I'm happy to obviously to take the <laughs> call question. I'll, I'll let you deal with the hard stuff. Um, yeah, good, good point. And it's true. I've been doing that exercise too um, over the past years. And I mean, the Yugoslavia example is, of course, the kind of the big example. Um, uh, also, because in, in football terms, it ended up, you know, really affecting the outcome of, of that tournament. Um, now, <laughs> Still, it, we remember this because it's quite exceptional. And if you think about the past um, few years, um, last year, was it last year? It feels like a decade ago during the Euros, um, there was this um, really quite low level, if you think about it, um, little um, dispute between um, the Munich Stadium and the kind of German Football Federation and UEFA because um, um, they wanted to light the Allianz Arena um, home of, of Bayern Munich in the LGBTQ um, colors and the rainbow of flag. Um, now, this was prohibited um, as a as an infringement uh, of political neutrality. And many people there commented, well, that, that's really weird because one of the, the official actually slogans and aims of UFA is to, to you know, promote equality to combat anti-discrimination. And on a slightly higher level, we've had a dispute um, a few years back with the Israeli Football Association for admitting teams that are located in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, there again, FIFA said, look, we can't really do anything based on our law. Now, so thinking kind of from that side, these small little political um, things were found to be too controversial to take a stance on, even though I think they were really easy ways to make uh, to take a stance whereas you know here the the reaction was so immediate and oddly also much faster than many other um international and, and regional <clears throat> organizations so, so something something's happening qatar i think is not quite the same because you know of course there's a lot of politics in in football uh, governance and there's a lot of money involved there's a lot of um corruption but it's it's usually kind of politics of the kind that oh we're we're getting too close to to rulers who the rest of the world might find a bit questionable. It's not this direct taking a stance in a in a conflict, um, telling this and this country that they've done something wrong or that and that country that they've something right. It's more this kind of schmoozing and, and and so I think this is very this is very different. This is a kind of in your face type um, uh, reaction to 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 a to a national government. So yeah, I, I think it is it is slightly different. I mean, it seems to me the second and third question about you know fiscal union, money, etc. I, I kind of I have the sense that they close uh, that, that they connect quite a, a bit to Flores topics. But I first wanted to make sure that. Uh, Julia, if there is a comment you would yes. like to uh, uh, on, on uh, Gary's comment, so what's what's the point of NATO? I, I guess it's it's it acts as as a safety net, as as a uh, as a almost in this context, it feels like a, a psychological threat. So there is NATO, but but then triggering it, it's it's a different question and clearly shows also the ineffectiveness in a way of of, of NATO. One can say in this in this context, but but of course there isn't a direct attack to the European Union and states of the European Union. So of course the, the uh, conditions to, to trigger NATO might, are, are not there. But, but again, it's in this context, it feels that uh, it acts as a psychological um, safety, safety net in this field. But, but then uh, going back to the point of, of sanctions and uh, specialized um, tribunal, I think that um, uh, I don't think we're, we're, I don't think we're living the same, um, the same air. I think, um, Things are changing in the sense that um, when it comes to um, when it comes to economic sanctions, in particular, the, the accent is is much stronger now. For example, compared to the past, um, 
whether, of course, there it depends what's the objective, of course, of, of, of sanctions, for example, and um, what is the real um, goal that we try to pursue, for example, uh, through sanctions. So, of course, there can be an economic uh, impact because that's what the sanction is about, in particular in the context of Russia. But um, but these clearly are instruments that do not uh, end the war. So um, so again, it's um, there is a mismatch between purposes and um, and instruments. Um, on the fiscal uh, aspects, uh, just very briefly, um, I think I agree with the point of, of David, but um, uh, but uh, I would leave this to Boris. I think that. Covid has put strain on on budgets and um, and member states politics are, are affected uh, deeply um, in their finances. So um, um, so I'm not sure that this is going to happen in the short in the very short term. Uh, I'm going to turn to Florence in just a second, but I just wanted to flag up for the people watching online that if you want to also contribute a question at this point and write something in the chat, uh, I'll have a look at it uh, um, as Floris is answering uh, the, the set of questions. Thank you. Um, thanks for the question, Gary. Uh, it's nice that you come up with questions based on the translations. <laughs> I saw Veil being translated as bear. Let's see what it does there. Veil. Again. <laughs> um, is it 1917? Yeah, let's let's go for it. Yeah, we have this antichrist. We have the that even managed to get all 27 member states in line, which has never happened before. We have this highly symbolic meeting in Versailles, or next two days, where the EU is trying to rediscover itself in opposition to something else. So yeah, I mean, this might well be the moment when we look back at it where we say this is when something fundamentally shifted. Uh, but 20 years later, we had 1939. I know, I know I'm well aware of it. I'm not, I mean, this is not, this is not in my roadmap yeah, for the future yeah. of Europe either. But, um, you know, these are, these are events that are unfolding and there are some striking similarities, um, as you say. Now, on um, the prospect of fiscal union and um, David's questions as to, you know, aren't there many steps and hurdles to be taken legally, economically, effectively? Uh, absolutely. So, the, to the extent that we have debt mutualization at the moment, it's uh, both within the Next Generation EU Fund post COVID and the new Repower EU. It is both time limited. So, uh, the Next Generation 2027, I think, and this one will be 2030. It is limited to an amount of money. It's also limited amount of money per member state. And that money is limit is partially a loan and partially grants. So partially it's actually debt mutualization. So partially it's a loan has to be repaid, formally speaking, by the member state. So these the sort of resistance by the so-called fiscal hawks in Germany, uh, Austria, Finland, Netherlands have been built in in that process. So Macron and Draghi wanted sort of an open debt mutualization. So both these limits have been built in to the point that now that they're discussing a new project, they are already there from the proposal onwards. So it's clear that these things, there will never be a fiscal union that's in that's indefinite, that comes without conditions. So the conditions, what you can use the money for is very, very strict. The conditions, for example, now there, I mean, this is all up for discussions. I just know someone who's involved in the preparations and they say that one of the things that are very clear is that when it comes to spending on military or energy for this new package, it has to be a transnational mm -hmm. arrangement. It's not member states can't go their own way. It has to be coordinated. So Austria can spend on a part of the military equipment, but then other member states spend on something else. And I think at least when it comes to your question on the military side, you're completely right. Obviously, it does make sense for each member state to have a little bit of everything. So this is what I mean when we think if you were to move to this geopolitical actor, it comes with all these questions that we actually are uncomfortable asking and answering. That yes, that we can have a significant military presence that's available as a defensive or offensive action, but it has to be collective. That's the only way in which this can happen, which solidifies the EU in one way, but also creates very problematic questions about who gets to decide these things, what are the effects, and, and how, how do citizens feed into this process. Um, yeah. Okay, Can thanks. I just comment on that, because that's what we have NATO for. So what would EU militarization add that NATO already doesn't cover? And if NATO isn't getting involved in this war, and we saw last night that it doesn't want anything to do with it, what would the EU uh, military do 
in response that NATO doesn't. It would well, be just as hesitant. No, so the, the idea is very much this. The, idea, the, the, the birth of this idea of an EU as a military actor comes from Trump's question. What if Trump is re-elected again? You know, NATO is not going to come to defense if there's three boots on the ground in the Baltics. So we need, even if we never use it, we need the ability to assert the European interests or to project European interests, ideally in combination with other global powers, but if necessary, also without support of those actors. Okay, I'm going to, I guess we do have a good online question that I would like the, the panel to turn to. Um, so Russia has threatened that it might respond to EU sanctions by nationalizing EU businesses and assets. What legal remedies does the EU have and does the EU possess the legal means to nationalize Russian businesses and assets? And uh, as, as I'm reading it out, a second question pops in by a certain Mrs. Michaela. Uh, to what extent do we think the, oh my goodness, uh, to, <laughs> to what extent do we think the EU is assisting the Ukraine with making decisions? About which, about which peace arrangement to accept. And then the final question that we can take, and that will be the, the wrap up, um, is a European army possible at this point? Um, so let's, um, well, Rachel, if we get to you, <laughs> great, but I'm not making any promises at this point. But let's, let's, um, let's I think particularly also uh, focus on the first two, given that I think the third one's already had a bit of an airing uh, at this point, so. Should I yes, perhaps, please, Julia. Perhaps. And so um, that's that's a very interesting point, and I think that um, in principle, as far as I as I know, there aren't really some some legal um, say mechanisms that um, uh, that exist in this field and and remedies for um, for this, unless uh, one can think of. Um, a, a, extraordinary uh, extraordinary measures or an international uh, agreement between the member states in this field to, to achieve this this result unless of course there is an agreement reached through your institutions but that's a, that's a very um that's a very good question and i think that um uh, this goes a bit uh, perhaps uh, back to what Dr. gary was asking so what is going to be the reaction of, of russia in a way and uh, to sanctions um and uh, and i think these are um uh, emerging questions that um, I think will require um, a political, even before the legal um, mechanisms, to be uh, to be uh, successfully addressed. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be very brief. I, I mean, I think it's uh, well, probably in theory, at least our international trade law mm -hmm. friends, mm -hmm. you know, would be would have something to say mm -hmm. about this. And mm -hmm. although I wonder as much. As, Flores has mentioned this before, within the EU law plays a massive role in this conflict, although maybe less so um, now. I think it's it's going to be a tougher uh, situation when we speak about Russian domestic law coming from the outside or yeah. trade relations with Russia. I, I, my feeling is ultimately there's going to be a political solution yeah. to that. Um, yeah, Eva's question, I, I don't know. I actually don't have any expert knowledge. Maybe maybe your uh, your friend or colleague uh, will know something. I My feeling um, would actually be that um, in maybe, you know, in addition to supplying some kind of general knowledge and diplomatic know-how, it, it's actually going to be the Ukrainians who are going to call the mm -hmm. shots here. Um, and partly because of the way in which the, the conflict um, uh, has developed. And very quickly to Luca's question, who's one of our L232 students. I mean, on the European army, we've touched on this and David has um, asked um, a question, Flores has answered. It just one point, which maybe other than the the mere technical stuff, who's going to get which fighters and artillery, etc. I think one of the issues will also be, and we forget that we still have some EU member states who have a strict neutrality policy, right? I mean, um, I would be curious to hear um, Swedes, for instance, uh, you know, discussing the prospect of an army in their name going uh, into another country and and uh, and you know fighting. So I think in addition to the to the technical and kind of coordinating uh, issues, we'll have a real conversation here about um, yeah how how to how to make that happen. You know, countries who've had a long history of 
uh, like France, you know, being involved in conflicts and other countries who really don't want to do that for historical reasons. Yeah, so I mean, I think with the Lucas question, sort of, yes, an European army of some sort will emerge and not one of these centralized European army will be cobbled together by different member states that want to do something. The much more difficult question is, will it ever be deployed and under which conditions and in which situations? That's, that's a question that's infinitely more difficult than politically you know, dynamites, might lead to the implosion of the EU's, these kind of, these, these kind of essential, essential questions. But now, uh, very briefly, can, can, us we, points? can yeah. we just briefly, because uh, we have a, a minute and a half, <laughs> so I would like to just uh, give, a, a, if we can pay a little bit of attention to Rachel's question, mm -hmm. which is basically, you know, like this existence of, of this supranational mm -hmm. structure, is this actually kind of helping to de-escalate, or mm -hmm. is it actually poking the bear in a much more uh, much more frightening way uh, than would have happened if the EU hadn't been there on the doorstep. So if you could give your uh, very brief assessment on that, and we're going to close up the session. With that. Yes, go ahead, Julia. I, I, I think I think it's um, I think in principle it's helping uh, de-escalating, um, but that's uh, again it depends on the perspective I would say because um, I think this is uh, this directly goes into how how Russia then is is um, responding to it, and even though, of course, I mean the, the, the international law at this point hasn't had a very immediate effect. In the longer term, it might escalate, but there will be huge sacrifices made, uh, mostly by Ukrainians. Uh, so that would be my my answer to this question. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 if anyone's guess is as, as good as ours, probably, but actually my feeling is maybe slightly different. I I have more of the feeling that the kind of, uh, yeah, the legal instruments we've been seeing, the, the EU legal instruments uh, in particular, um, I'm not sure they lead to de-escalating. It feels more that um, the EU can't go to war realistically um, here, so it's doing everything it can. Um, in terms of economic, uh, financial, uh, cultural, regulatory sanctions, um, it can and it hasn't done yet everything. Um, it hasn't uh, reached the kind of uh, the full potential. But I, I'm actually not sure if it's having a de-escalating role. But I do think um, that many people think it's it's a justified um, intervention into uh, into this uh, conflict. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm might again slightly different. Maybe wait and just, just, I, I think. Ukrainian's geographical position is a problem mm -hmm. to an extent that has its face with and its citizens and its its projection of aspirations are torn to two sides between the one the EU has very successfully projected this project of sort of freedom and democracy. It isn't always like that, but it's projecting that and it's it's been committed to sort of expand its geographical reach. So it's made promises to Ukraine as well with the accession uh, agreed uh, treaties. So there is they fed this potential, this aspiration, and the EU must commit to that as well. And on the other hand, of course, we have a very different vision of Ukraine's future. And Ukrainians, I very, think Jan very rightly say that this is a decision that will have to be made by Ukrainians. And if that decision is that they want to strengthen ties with the EU, I hope the EU does everything it can to, um, to commit well, to that promise. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I will uh, close off the session now. Thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we have a host of events. Uh, we have some blogs on uh, the law school website already. We have a, um, a newsletter. Um, and also we have another event right here tomorrow evening, uh, which I think will be chaired by you, David, on the effect with Jonathan Fisher on the effectiveness of sanctions. At what time is that? That's right, it's so 3.30 to 5. That's at 3.30 uh, tomorrow. So thank you for your engagement. Thank you to our excellent panel of speakers uh, and good night. Okay. <laughs>